Welcome back to The Conservatine. I'm your host, Chase Lovett, and today I have a very special guest joining us. He is a former Republican candidate for Utah's 1st Congressional District and a former civilian intelligence officer. I'd like to welcome Andrew Badger onto the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Hey, Chase, thanks for having me. I'd love to be with you today and, and really love your setup you got. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, my first question for you is a super simple question, and but it's what is the biggest problem we as Americans face today and what is the solution to that problem? Yeah, so I think we face a, a multitude of problems, but the first and foremost problem we face is our own tyrannical government. Uh, you know, our founders were very concerned about the concentration of power. This was really the first principle uh, of what they were trying to prevent in the design of our constitution, uh, of our constitutional republic. And right now we have an unprecedented concentration of power in Washington, D.C. And it's not just the government. I mean, it's it's big business, it's big tech, it's big media, and they're all working together in collusion for the same goal. And really, that's essentially the definition of fascism. Fascism is essentially state power being enacted through corporations. It's much more insidious, much more dangerous than, say, communism, which basically the government takes control of all levers of society, of all levers of the economy. Right now we have this you know, a concentration of power in Washington, basically what you call the establishment, you know, quite the establishment, and yeah. they control the levers of power. And really, there's no check, they have no accountability. I think they fundamentally despise, you know, the kind of middle class American people in the in the hinterlands. And it's a, it's a huge threat. I mean, we're seeing this play out with the FBI raid on President Trump's home. Uh, we're seeing this play out with just unprecedented spending. We're seeing this play out big tech censoring us on social media. And I, I really think this is, uh, you know, probably the number one threat we face as a, a country. I think that's kind of the first bucket. The second bucket is foreign affairs and that you can't overlook that as well. I mean, we're on the possibly the brink of a global nuclear war with not only yeah. Russia, but China uh, in, in very dangerous uh, border conflicts right now uh, where we have no effective diplomatic communication. Uh, we have very little military to military exchange. And we're, you know, it just takes a little tinder to set off what could be a, a major conflagration. So uh, I think we face basically two, these two buckets. We have this kind of domestic um, uh, tyranny through this establishment, again, not just government, but also big corporations, big tech. And then yeah. foreign policy wise, we have these two threats from China and Russia. And the worst possible scenario is playing out where China and Russia are teaming up uh, and creating this kind of axes that we've never faced anything like it before. I mean, it's it's far greater danger than World War II, World War I. And it's quite it's quite dangerous time. And I think the problem is most Republican leadership just think that everything's fine, you know, just play, go along to get along. Things are, are good. I mean, I just saw this article of, of uh, John Curtis and Chris Stewart saying, oh, well, you know, we, we should be optimistic. Everything's, you know, it's going to be OK. And uh, look, you have to be optimistic, but you also have to be a realist yeah. with the, the threats that we face. So uh, I just don't see that sense of urgency with our current Republican leadership. Um, and I think it's quite troubling. Yeah. So what, what's the solution to this? What, what's your answer? Yes, yeah, so <laughs> that's a good question. I think uh, I really I think we need kind of a, a populist bottom up re revolution, you know, where we need to devolve power that's been concentrated in Washington, D.C. And the big difference, and this is the key, I think, for the new right, basically kind of your generation coming up is we have to understand that the concentration of power and the, the tyranny and abuse of rights can come not just from government. Can also come from big business. It also come from corporations, big tech, uh, you know, censoring our free speech. Um, and we have to be able to take on that threat. I mean, one one example is BlackRock, which is basically a multinational investment firm. And what they've done is they've bought up all the single houses, uh, single family homes across the United States, and then rent them out. You know, so essentially we're creating this kind of feudal system where we're serfs, where we're basically we don't own our own private property. We have to rent it. Uh, as you know, the feudal serfs used to do. And we have to come up with creative solutions to take on BlackRock. I mean, uh, the old kind of neoconservative, you know, 1990s Bush era Republicans would say, well, no, 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 BlackRock is a private corporation. They can do whatever they want. That's not necessarily the case. You know, the concentration of power, again, is the key issue. And that can become, whether your rights are being abused by the government or a big corporation, I don't really see the difference. Your rights are still being abused. And yeah. that's what our founders were worried about. I mean, at during the founders' time, it was big government. You know, that was the number one threat. Uh, actually, if you do go back to the freedom of speech issue, 
um, in, in England, it was being abused through private um, media channels where basically they were being restricting speech on behalf of government. And that's essentially what we're seeing play out right now. And that's why the First Amendment isn't just about the government. It's also about the essential idea of the freedom of speech. And just one quick example on that is there's a New York Times author named Alex Berenson. He's been writing very critically of our public health response to COVID-19. And uh, he was just deplatformed from Twitter. And they, you know, through a lawsuit, which is called Discovery, where you can look at kind of all the documents, they found out the White House was pushing Twitter to deplatform this journalist who was critical of the COVID-19 response. So um, I think it's quite dangerous. And I think, yeah, we need a bottom-up revolution. We need to devolve power from Washington, D.C. And the most critical thing we need for Republicans is to get fighters in, in office who understand the threats we're up against, who have that sense of urgency. And it just it sounds simple, but who are willing to fight back. And you're seeing that right now play out again with the FBI raid on Trump. You're seeing some Republicans stay quiet. You're seeing some Republicans who are really standing up and willing to fight back. Yeah, um, you know, I couldn't agree more because we have people in Republican leadership like Liz Cheney and people like her. And it's just it's not working because yeah. they're not fighting for the Americans. Yeah, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, they can kind of try to spin things as much as they want during the primary season. But the, the facts speak for themselves. I mean, we're yeah. not the countries in the wrong direction. Uh, our conservative Republicans are not being that counterweight in, in terms of checking the abuse of Democrats. And what I say is, and really, you know, Democrats aren't necessarily the greatest threat to our conservative movement. It's rhinos. You know, oh, yeah. I call them beta Republicans because they're just weak Republicans, um, because they're the ones who take your seat from the table. They're the ones who prevent you from being able to fight back. Democrats, have, you know, they've been crazy. I mean, they're especially crazy now. I mean, 1990s Bill Clinton, when I was in elementary school, for example, he was essentially it would be a pretty strong Republican today. Uh, but, you know, the Democrats are going to do their thing. The issue is when Republicans, when we, um, you know, betray ourselves from the inside, that is what's so dangerous. And, you know, we see these Republicans say all these things during primary season, you know, oh, I'm going to fight back. And then they, you know, the FBI raids President Trump's house and they, yeah. stay, stay, they stay silent. So I think it's a yeah. huge issue. Yeah. Um, my second question for you is, as you campaigned across Utah's first congressional district, what is the biggest concern voters came to you with? So, yeah, I mean, the, the three main concerns I what I ran on and what I identified that our representatives weren't speaking out on first and foremost is election integrity. Yeah. You know, there is a serious lack of confidence in our election procedures, uh, not just from the 2020 election. Let's not forget the Democrats did never accepted the 2016 election. Yeah. But the simple fact is when you're voting on these machines where you have mail-in voting, ballots are being blasted out all over the place. You have early voting, you have you know voting procedures or they're, you know, they're counting the votes early, but then they're saying, well, we're going to count them on election day. It's just this huge complicated process. It doesn't instill trust or confidence. And I think that was a huge issue. It's a huge issue in Utah right now where basically we have universal mail-in ballots. So that means they blast out ballots to everyone. You don't even have to request it. You don't have to have any type of special exception. So people are just getting these ballots in the mail. I mean, obviously you have the issue of fraud, that type of thing, uh, you know, we saw with 2000 mules, uh, but you also just have very low informed, uninformed voters <laughs> making these decisions. Uh, you also have early voting. So people are casting their ballot and then finding out, oh, well, this person voted for the January 6th commission or, or that type of thing. And they didn't know that before they voted. Uh, but the biggest thing we have to change in Utah is the universal mail-in ballots uh, because you're just getting people who are voting who have no clue what's going on, and it's not a good thing. We're not a democracy. We're a republic, and there's a big difference. Uh, the second key issue was around parental rights and education. You know, parents have the fundamental right to control their education of their children. Um, you know, we're seeing this abuse from the FBI, Department of Education. One of my big issues was devolving power from the Department of Education so we could switch that power back to the states, local control, have more effective outcomes there. And then third was uh, medical freedom. And I got a lot of, oh, you know, I was end of mandates. Well, the mandates are all over. No, they're not, you know, and they're coming back. And the Democrats are going to try to do the same playbook as before. Uh, and, you know, the, again, these Republicans, oh, no, the mandates don't, they, they don't matter anymore. They do matter. Uh, one, we need to get justice for what happened in this, you know, COVID tyranny where people's abuse, you know, their rights were being abused. They couldn't go to church. They couldn't speak freely. Uh, you know, these are core fundamental rights. Uh, and 
you know, they say, well, it was an emergency, so we have to sometimes, no, you know, the constitution wasn't designed to protect our rights during the good times, that's easy. The constitution was designed to protect our rights during these emergencies, during these times of crises. And that's what we didn't see during the COVID era. We're not out of the COVID era yet. You know, there could be very much this kind of resurgence of the virus. Um, you know, I was just <laughs> flipping through on, and then CNN had climate crisis. So now they're going to try to do the same playbook from COVID to the, you know, quote unquote climate. When I was your age, it was called global warming, you know, mm -hmm. and this is what the left does so effectively is they rebrand things. They create a narrative. Um, so when it's global warming, if, if the temperatures don't go up, you're in a problem, right? <laughs> but if you call it climate change, this amorphous term, I mean, the climate always changes. It doesn't even mean anything if you actually yeah. think about it. Uh -huh. uh, but then basically they can say, well, it's getting colder in this place. Oh, that's climate change. Oh, it's getting hotter. Oh, you know, so they, they control these terms and the next term they're going to use is climate crisis. And so they're going to try to do that same playbook. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I think, the, I think the biggest one that people, what I would hear from people that wasn't, especially wasn't being addressed was the election integrity issue. Yeah, that's awesome. I interviewed uh, Utah State House Representative Mike Peterson um, about a month ago, and he yeah. asked me how he was, um, they were working on to get more bills passed to improve election integrity. So that was really awesome to know that the Utah House is doing something about that. And trying to fix it but yeah we'll see i'm not sure <laughs> i don't know i i think they're trying but i'm yeah. not too up to date on I mean, what specific but there are some good good i mean that's the, and this fight is really going to be at the state level um yeah. you know unfortunately our federal leadership doesn't really care about this issue uh except for mike lee perhaps uh but yeah i mean guys like mike peterson up in you know cash area uh you have senator john johnson who's down in weber county um the biggest uh, advocate is probably representative phil lyman um, he's down in um, Blanding, Southern Utah. So there's definitely some really strong state reps, and hopefully they can push it. Uh, yeah. I think we need we need to we need more of them though, and especially in our party leadership, our state state reps. Uh, they really have, just haven't made this the issue that um, that it deserves. So yeah, um, I want to kind of switch. You had mentioned the FBI raid on President Trump's home. I want to know what's your opinion on that, and why do you believe? the FBI raided Trump's home? Because according to Trump, he says it's a political yeah. execution. What is your opinion on that? Oh, I mean, it's definitely this just, you know, it's a it's a political operation. They're basically going on a, a fish finding mission where they're trying to, I mean, look, they're collecting all these documents uh, and then whether they plan evidence, whether they, you know, kind of take things out of context and make this big hoopla out of things. I mean, the context here is absolutely essential. I mean, we had for four years, the Russia hoax uh, where basically the, I mean, the FBI planted evidence. I mean, they used Steele dossier, which was basically uh, opposition research, uh, you know, collecting all these rumors. They created this dossier and then the FBI took that and this was funded by the Hillary Clinton campaign. The FBI used that as basically just, you know, they took that as the warrant, you know, to what was called the FISA court, which is how the FBI gets uh, warrants to do electronic surveillance. Um, and so basically, they spied on the Trump campaign for four years. They they finally admit that it was illegal. That was wrong. Uh, they fabricated evidence. Um, yeah, you know, there was an FBI lawyer who basically, uh, you know, he, when he was submitting the warrant to get approval, spy on Carter Page, which was a Trump campaign member. He it, it, the problem is a lot of these issues are so complicated. It's hard for I think the public yeah. to really fully understand it. But basically, you know, Carter Page was uh, a businessman traveling overseas, and he was getting debriefed by the CIA. Uh, you know, so he had contacts with Russian businessmen. When this FBI lawyer sent it to the FISA court, he cut out the part where Carter Page was working with the U.S. government and just said Carter Page is is contacting Russian businessmen. You know, so he, out, he manipulated this document and that allowed, you know, the, the surveillance on the Trump campaign. Um, so this context is absolutely important for understanding what's going on with this FBI raid. Uh, and it's just unprecedented. You know, we're allowing the FBI to assume this, um, you know, again, extraordinary powers. And, and the problem with these rhinos, or I call them beta Republicans, and or the big tent Republicans is the name they like. Um, is they think it's going to stop with Trump. It's not going to stop with Trump. They're going to use the same playbook. They're going to do the same thing against DeSantis. Look, I'm old enough when I was your age, you know, they, they vilified Bush. Like he was Hitler. You know, they did the same thing to Mitt Romney. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a little bit harder for them to, I think, do that because, you know, he's kind of just a such a beta personality. But, you know, yeah. oh, he put his dog on his car. Oh, he, he said this awkward phrase in a debate, you know, binders full of women. Um, and, you know, he was a massage, just all those things. And then, and then they did a Trump 
and they're going to do the same thing, you know, DeSantis yeah. or whoever comes after DeSantis. And that's what these big tent Republicans, rhinos don't understand. Um, and it's just such an unprecedented abuse of power. And yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're in, um, we're in new waters here and it's going to be dangerous to see what happens. I mean, one of the key issues for why the Roman Republic and Roman empire devolved and collapsed was because you had this Praetorian guard, you know, which were basically the emperor's personal bodyguard. And once they kind of got implanted into Rome proper and started basically controlling, they became king makers. It was so dangerous, it became so volatile, so toxic. And that's essentially what we're having happen is this FBI is kind of morphing into this Praetorian guard to basically be the, you know, the, the foot soldiers of their democratic party to enforce their doctrines. I mean, I mean, just the double standard is just absolutely insane. I mean, you had Comey going out and saying, oh, it doesn't matter. Hillary Clinton had top secret information. You know, this is not a prosecutable, no reasonable, he said no reasonable prosecutor would pursue this statue, you know, and then you have the FBI, like, 30 dudes with armed. I mean, they were going, and the thing is too, they, you know, it was a nine and a half hour raid. They had 30 guys, uh, you know, they're going through all these boxes. They just came out, you know, the, including, you know, executive privilege, including um, client lawyer, client uh, privilege. And so it's just absolutely insane. Even if you were to say that Trump had this doc, and then, you know, obviously getting this issue of Trump had the ability to declassify yeah. these documents as president himself. So, and then, then there's another issue too, is, you know, if, if this was like vital, classified information of you know about our nuclear weapons program you know why did they wait so long you know they they got this uh warrant approved they waited like three days to execute it you know so yeah yeah i mean there's just so many issues here and again the burden of proof is on the fbi i mean these big tent republican democrats who just trust the fbi at this point are absolutely insane you know if look if if russiagate had come out and russiagate was true you know and basically trump really was a secret agent and the fbi was right I would defer to the FBI and say, okay, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, but they were completely wrong. So you have to, a reason, any reasonable person has to give the benefit of the doubt here um, to, you know, the FBI basically concocting this political hit job. Yeah, no, I agree. Do you think that this act on President Trump helps him get, help, helps him gain more, like, what am I trying to say? Gain more momentum in yeah. 2024 run. Yeah, no, I mean, it undoubtedly, you know, fired up Trump's base, you know, it kind of reinforces his bona fides as he's a fighter. Uh, this is kind of a key issue, right? If the establishment, if the media aren't coming after you, they're not attacking you, they don't view you as a threat. You know, why don't they go after Mitt Romney? Because Mitt Romney doesn't threaten their agenda. You know, he doesn't challenge them. Uh, and that's why they they pull out. And then, you know, you kind of, there's a correlation between how much of a threat you are and how much they attack you. Yeah. And this just kind of shows how scared they are of Trump gaining power again. And it's definitely fired up his base um, and kind of, you know, put him back in the in the front run. I think, you know, Trump is, you know, he's he's had some hit or misses um, since being out of office. I think the one issue where he lost, I think, a lot of credibility with his base was kind of on the vaccine issue. He's kind of trying to take credit for the vaccine rollout, and he was kind of not listening to the audience on that one. <laughs> People were like, "We really don't want to hear about that." Yeah. Uh, but then, yes, yeah, so I think, but he's listened. You know, he listened, and he kind of pivoted away from that. And this definitely just shows, you know, that Trump is going to be the fighter. And I mean, the one issue though is that it's just going to, you know, <sighs> the left is just prepared to burn down the house to keep him out of office. Yeah. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a volatile next few years. Um, yeah. so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it will be super interesting 2024, that election. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, what do you think about Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene filing articles of impeachment of Attorney General Merrick Garland? I mean, she's dead on. I mean, we have to show consequences to the left or also keep doing what they've done before. This was the big issue with Russia Gate. No one's ever suffered any consequences from their actions. This lawyer I mentioned, this FBI lawyer. I think he was debarred for one year, suspended. Now he's back, you know, in the FBI being a lawyer again. Uh, Durham, I think, is a is an idiot. I don't think he's going to actually do anything, and you know, uh, he hasn't. I mean, I think if you remember, there was uh, Sussman, Clinton's lawyer. He didn't even bring charges against him. Uh, you know, this needed to be aired out before the 2020 election. He's been doing this for like three years now. 
Uh, so I don't think there's going to be any consequences from Durham. And the problem is they got away with Russiagate, so they know they can do it again. You know, if FBI if FBI officials have been severely punished for Russiagate, do you think they'd be trying to do the same stuff again? No. Uh, yeah. They got away with it. They're going to do it again. So Marjorie Taylor Greene is dead on. We need to inflict consequences on this administration. Uh, Thomas Massey, Representative Thomas Massey, yeah. the big issue we have is a minority party. The big leverage we have is the purse strings, you know. And this is what you have those Republicans like I, I ran against Blake Morton. Yeah. Oh, we can't do anything about it, guys. We're the minority party. No, we you, they need uh, the minority party to pass legislation that create, gives us the leverage. And we need to start using that leverage of not funding the FBI, not funding these institutions yeah. um, unless they have serious change. So I support I support uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene on that. Um, I'll throw it out there. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a hell of a lot more effective fighter than Mitt Romney. <laughs> so that's, oh, uh, you, you should put that on the tagline to uh, oh, yeah. get some views because it's true. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene, yeah, she's not like a polished speaker sometimes and she says some awkward phrases or what have you, but she's a fighter, you know, and she, she understands what people, under, you know, what the people want. And she's not afraid to take the kind of slings and arrows of the establishment where you have someone like Mitt Romney who's so out of touch with the people, uh, you know, he has this mansion in Park City, he doesn't listen to anyone in Utah, and he just wants to appease the establishment. He wants to be yeah. accepted into their in crowd. Uh, and that's, I was just posting on Facebook, actually. I mean, that's why he, he, he marches at these BLM, you know, he marched in the BLM, you know, protests, you know, raising his fists and look, guys, I'm one of you. He just doesn't have that courage to stand strong. And this, this really is what separates Republicans is any Republican can vote for tax cuts, you know, stand strong on abortion, those, those issues. But are they going to stand for when the, you know, the whole tide comes down on you when, you know, oh, Trump's a, a Russian agent. If you don't accept, oh, uh, we have to accept the COVID vaccine mandates. Oh, the 2020 election was most free and fair. But that's when we see the differentiation. That's when we see Republicans who are these kind of beta Republicans cower and you know appease the left and that's kind of your natural human instinct we as humans we want to be kind of part of the group you know we don't want to be ostracized and that's why you have these republicans who uh you know go along with it and i think it you know it's kind of jordan peterson big five personality but um it goes along with um basically agreeableness they don't want to disagree they don't like being ostracized the thing is we need those republicans to stand firm in those moments of craziness when it's Oh, we have to support the Ukraine war. No questions asked. Oh, we have to support COVID vaccine mandates. Um, oh, the 2020 election. We need those people to say, no, you know, I'm not going to just go along with this and be willing just to take that abuse that you're going to get. Uh, and that's why Marjorie Taylor Greene is so effective. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, my last couple of questions for you kind of have to do with you running for office. And I've just wondered these questions for a little bit now since I came across your campaign. Um, yeah. Looking back five to 10 years ago, maybe even two years ago, have, did you ever see yourself running for public office? And what was your call to action? Yeah, I mean, not so much. I've always been interested in politics, um, never really got too interested, uh, too involved. I've always been more in the national security when I was kind of your age and 9-11 happened. And that was kind of my impetus for uh, like getting in the fight and, uh, you know, wanting to be uh, an intelligence officer deployed to Afghanistan. Um, so I wasn't too involved politically, you know, but then what, what really, I guess, quote, unquote, radicalized me is the last two years. I mean, what we had with the was first started off with the, um, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter hysteria. I remember just watching these scenes of, you know, statues of Abraham Lincoln being torn down and all these people on, even though your friend, you know, conservative friends on social media posting the black squares and saying how racist America is. And then you went to what was the next one? Oh yeah, the COVID, you know, just the COVID. I mean, one of the biggest issues was the COVID hysteria. I'm just so extremely pissed off when the government tries to say, you have to take this vaccine or, you know, locking us down, forcing these masks on children. Uh, I mean, just, I have this revulsion of even being forced to wear a mask into a store or, um, you know, being forced to take a vaccine. Uh, and then just, yeah, I mean, the, the 2020 election, uh, was another what big one, you know, again, my Republican friends, oh, no, 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 it's fine, you know, universal mail-in ballots, I have no issues. Um, and then the big one that kind of pushed me over the top was the collapse of Afghanistan, which happened yeah. actually basically like a year ago today. And the fact that we just had this completely incompetent government and no one's being held accountable. And, 
you know, that, that's one of the big reasons why I ran, uh, especially with a guy like Blake Moore in the office who, you know, voted for the January 6th commission, idolized Liz Cheney as his mentor. Uh, and then, you know, they, they say, oh, well, we're going to make them suffer consequences. No, they don't do anything. You know, when uh, Trump and Jan- Trump January 6th, what did the left do? They, they went full nuclear. And so many Republicans voted for impeachment. They voted for a censor resolution condemning Trump like, like Moore did, like Curtis did, like Romney did. And they don't do any of that for Biden. You know, <laughs> like, why are they fighting Trump harder than they fight Biden, who's literally destroying our country? When, you know, arguably, we had the most prosperous four years under Trump, if you just cut out, if you were to turn off your TV, and you weren't paying attention to any of the kind of hysteria, our economy, our foreign policy. Um, I'm, you know, I, I, I follow foreign policy quite a bit. And I would argue against anyone that Trump's foreign policy is probably the most effective, uh, one of the most effective in the modern presidential era. And so that was the decision I, I run. I just, I just, I was so frustrated. I couldn't stand it anymore that our representatives weren't listening to us and that they weren't fighting for us. Uh, unfortunately, the issue in Utah is again, the universal mail-in ballots just completely changes the dynamic. Um, yeah. So where you have the America First movement is excel, you know, succeeding all across the country in, in Arizona, you know, with Carrie Lake, Blake Masters, uh, you know, J.D. Vance in, in Ohio, um, Joe Kent in Washington. Yeah. Uh, but in Utah, it's just so difficult um, for the America First movement to take off because the, assist, the system is basically so rigged against us in terms of uh, mail-in ballots, early voting. Uh, yeah. They've neutered the convention process. Um, so it's, it's quite difficult in that sense. But, you know, I think we woke up a lot of people, you know, uh, we got a lot of people fired up. A lot of people didn't quite know how bad their leadership was. You know, I got emails from people saying, wow, I didn't even know my representative voted for the January 6th commission or, you know, went along with this climate change issue. Uh, I mean, that's a big one. I mean, a lot of our Utah reps are pushing climate change. I mean, John Curtis is his yeah. signature issue. Blake Moore is on the climate change caucus and met with climate change. And it's just crazy. You know, these guys, our country is burning to the ground and they're focused on this myth of climate change. Um, and so yeah, that's why I decided to run. Yeah. Um, do you see yourself running ever again for any other, any office, let's say? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. I think, uh, you know, I'd probably run at the state level, uh, more at the local level where it's kind of, it's more of a fair fight, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I actually want the one issue I did take away, uh, lesson I learned from taking away from running is how much, how important our state representatives are, you know, especially with election integrity, especially with our education. Uh, you know, they, there's a lot of things the state level can do to push back on the, the vaccine mandates, which we saw. Um, and we don't really pay too much attention to it. I mean, at least I didn't before, you know, you're always kind of focused on the bigger issues. Um, yeah. But really the state is so important. Uh, and so, and the state level, you do have kind of a fair fight. Um, the problem with the federal races right now, it's just pretty much a money game, you know, where you have these PACs who can donate hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to the incumbent. And if you're a challenger, you can't, get that money yeah. and then you're basically in this ad war uh where you're up against the establishment who's getting big pharma big tech uh you know having liz cheney fundraise for them like blake moore uh and then you're, you can't compete against that level of funding I mean, utah is not really well known for its um grassroots donations um you know like in other states i think it's because we've been kind of complacent because we always oh we're, we're republicans are always going to win it doesn't really matter what type of republican um, and that's why the convention was so important. That's because it, it was a fair fight. You know, you had a thousand delegates. Each delegate was vetting the candidates, um, you know, through hundreds of, we did hundreds of one-on-one phone calls basically with each voter. Uh, and then, you know, we were very fortunate to come out with like just shy of 60% of the convention vote. Um, Chris Herod, he won about the same. Then you kind of had the results flipped in the primary and, and the primary, you know, they'll say, well, it's because um, the convention delegates are out of touch with the primary voters, which is not true at, at all. You know, actually, most of the convention voter uh, delegates were just normal people, normal Republicans, and they just did more. They did more of their homework. They actually vetted the candidates. Um, so I don't think I would run for federal office again until Utah, especially, can kind of change its election system. Uh, you know, we got to get back to more Republican principles and we've got to empower the state convention again. Yeah, well, that would be totally awesome if you ran for a state house spot seat. Um, that'd be really cool. But yeah, uh, I have one more question for you. Yeah, and for sure. It is 
what is your message to anybody who has the same views and beliefs as us and wants and sees that America is in a really bad place, but they're scared to speak up about their beliefs and they're scared to just share their views? What, what's your message to those people? Yeah, so I think the first one is you're not alone. <laughs> you know, don't feel like you're alone. I know that's one of the issues I, I came across with people. Uh, second, you know, get involved on social media. You know, that's good, but we don't need keyboard warriors. You know, we need people to get out and go get involved. And it doesn't mean you have to be spending all this time knocking doors, but there's so many other groups out there. There's a lot of friends at Weber County Patriots. You know, there's um, a Patriot Movement in Cache County. Just get out, go to their once a, uh, the Summit County Freedom, Summit County. Get out, you know, go to these events. Um, my friend Jason Preston started the We Are the People movement. Um, you know, go out there, you'll you'll meet with other patriots, you'll be really, I think, excited by that and yeah. have the same views as you. Go to speaker events like when Glenn Beck came to Logan and, and go to those type of events. Um, and I think that yeah, I mean, just get involved at the local level. I mean, uh city council, school boards. I would say run as a, a delegate in the state convention system, but <laughs> you're probably wasting your time to be honest. Um, but the school board system, the city council, there's so much power that you can have in changing um, changing our country bottom up. So I would just I would just say get involved with some of these groups, and you'll be I think I think people will feel like wow, I'm not the only one. Other people understand the extent of our country uh, and the crises we have. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, also it really helps if you get out and support, you know, America first, freedom first candidates, you know, Mike Lee has an election coming up. It's not a, it's not a shoe in by any means. So, you know, just showing up to some of the events, getting out like you did and, and going to the parades and, and that type of thing is also really important. But, um, yeah, I mean, the one thing, and this was me, you know, I was kind of posting on social media and, you know, look, I got to get in the fight, you know, I'm not just going to be a keyboard warrior and that's. I think that's the big issue right now is we don't need keyboard warriors. We need people to get in the fight. And yeah. again, it doesn't have to be anything. You don't have to do, do what I did and quit your job and run for office. Uh, but you know, you, you can start the local level, go to the, you know, cash County. We need to change the leadership in cash County. That's the party local party level and get out and go to those events and, you know, get more involved, become a you know state delegate, um, those type of things. So, that's what I would encourage people to do. Yeah, awesome. I, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Um, I've been wondering yeah. for a while. It's super awesome that we're finally able to do it. Um, for all of you that don't know, I um, came across Andrew's campaign and was just like, I got to reach out to him. <laughs> and then I went and volunteered a little bit um, towards the last stretch of the campaign. But um, I wanted to thank you for all that you did. And thank you so much for coming on. Awesome. Thanks, Chase. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate your help in the campaign. You did a great job. Uh, what you're doing right now is awesome. You know, I'm so excited for the future generation of our, our conservatives. And it's great that you, what you're doing and uh, look forward to posting this podcast and getting it out. And hopefully people give it a listen. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, buddy. See ya. Yeah. See ya.